Hello and welcome to the Echo Chamber podcast. My name is Tony Groves and today we have a, another departure for us into the, into the realm of uh, filmmaking and documentaries. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host and everybody's secret Valentine, Martin McMahon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> More importantly, we're delighted and a little bit, uh, how would I put this, uh, blown away by the fact that we actually sit in here with uh, documentary maker, filmmaker and co-founder of the award-winning Esperanza Productions and um, soon to be uh, the, the, the documentary, um, the, the Impossible... Uh, Syria, the impossible revolution. Now, we're going to have the impossible revolution, folks. And if we're going to be pumping this out to you guys. This is coming out in DCU on... Yeah, well, it's already been launched, but we have a screening in DCU on the 15th mm-hmm. and one in Trinity College on the 22nd. Okay. So plenty of opportunities for people to see it. Guys, I've on, we've only seen a few minutes of this and it's quite powerful stuff. Without further ado, Ronan Tynan is sitting here with us and we're absolutely thrilled to have him. Yeah, absolutely thrilled. Thank well, you I'm very delighted. Much. I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to talk about the documentary because in fairness... Uh, I'm very affected by the people we met and what they've gone through in Syria. But the most frustrating thing of all is how there's so little understanding of what they've gone through and how they've been made to suffer. Because, um, in fact, it was one of the motivations that when we first started on this project about three years ago, that we decided to turn it into a feature length documentary to really look at the roots of the Syrian revolution, why it happened, And how it evolved the way it did because of that lack of understanding. Because, I mean, it's absolutely bizarre when you even look at on Twitter, for example, you see Syrian people being who are risking their lives every day, saving other people, being called terrorists, like the White Helmets, for example. And uh, having met them, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely upset about it because uh, if you even today in Idlib in Syria and Eastern Ghouta they are regularly targeted precisely because of who they are because they're saving lives and most importantly because they are first responders they're filming everything they're doing they're primary sources in gathering evidence for the war crimes that are being committed again on a daily basis I mean most people, if they hear this now, they won't even be aware that the UN Chief Human Rights um, Supremo uh, recently said that in the last few days, at least 250 civilians have been killed. I would say it's much more than that. But again, he blamed very unequivocally the indiscriminate airstrikes. Well, they're not indiscriminate, they're targeted airstrikes against civilians by the Assad regime and Putin's Russia. And the reason they're targeting civilians, particularly in Idlib, they are trying to cause, they're destroying civilian communities. They're trying to cause them to flee as a war strategy. And this is the big thing people miss about Syria from the very beginning. That from the very beginning, in 2011, when there was a peaceful uprising in Syria. It was a popular uprising. Popular uprising. People came out on the street, you know, during the Arab Spring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is one thing I found quite shocking as well, too. Uh, and again, it, only in the sense that very few people realize this, that all the experts on Syria did not expect Syria to participate in the Arab Spring. Mm, it was a stable. Um, and there was a, there was there was the 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 Assad regime, which was um, of, of the minority. But yet it was kind of uh, straddling both 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 well, aspects. Actually, no. I mean, like yourself, I might have had I might have been under those kind of illusions, too. But far from it. The Assad regime was so brutal, but so effective that everybody knew. They were, it was, it was and remains a totalitarian regime. Mm. People knew if you speak out of turn, you will be arrested, you will be tortured, and you might probably be killed if you upset enough people. Well, I remember Robert Fisk talking under the previous Assad walking, walking the streets of, of Aleppo and knowing that a certain part was a black site where people would disappear to and that was in the heart of the city you know that they so so yes i i i do accept that it wasn't uh it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't a democracy it was far from it oh well, yeah exactly yeah. And, but, but this is the thing that you often see on social media yeah, I, was just gonna, I was just going to say i i see regularly this before and after picture of syria and the the narrative is this was syria 
under Assad and this is what's happened since Assad is gone and that everybody else is to blame for this. And I see this quite a lot on, on social media. Unlike you, I, I tried to follow it for a while and got so lost in uh, the information, the disinformation, the black propaganda. It's very, very difficult for somebody coming into a cold like me to have any idea of what's going on whatsoever. But, but in fairness, though, this is what has been so disillusioning for me as well, too, that someone like Jeremy Corbyn, I remember before he became leader, I remember tweeting like a lot of people furiously because it was based in the UK at the time at the idea of him becoming leader of the, the Labour Party. But then to discover that Jeremy Corbyn has never attacked the sad regime of slaughtering civilians. He's never attacked Putin for slaughtering civilians. Uh, and he rightly, rightly condemns Israel for persecuting. Because, you know, on Twitter, I mean, I regularly attack yes. Israel as well. But the point is that, I mean, we can't be inconsistent. And the failure of some people on the left who see anyone in the Middle East opposing the United States as good, regardless of how brutal they are to their own people. Yeah. This problem is one of the things for many people on the left, including myself, is one of the fundamental reasons there's so-called confusion. Because many people have been prepared. You see it on social media. It, it, obviously, it, you get away with it on social media because there's so much fake news. You know, nothing has to be verified or whatever. People can sound off. Um, if someone from on the left says, for example, that Assad is, is allegedly uh, fighting American imperialism, this is supposed to mean that he's a good guy, regardless of the fact that he is slaughtering his own people. I mean, let's look at the let's look at the figures. Over five hundred thousand people have been killed in Syria since the Syrian uprising in twenty eleven. Many of the human rights and independent monitoring groups would say that over ninety percent of civilian casualties have been killed by the Assad regime. Obviously, the Russians when they began bombing with the Saad in 2015, have significantly increased. You know, they're also culpable for a lot of those war crimes. But that obviously contributes to a lot of... A lot of um, it, this is, there's, an element, there's an element of what we call um, the regressive left as well. If, if I mean, We talk about the regressive left and, and how this um, uh, better the devil, you know, almost uh, nonsense carries on. And it always reminds me of the of George Bush's famous comment when he said, "What do they hate?" And he said, "They they, they hate our freedom." And uh, uh, you know, and you go, "No, they'd actually lo love some of our bloody freedom, folks. They'd love um, they'd love self governance. They'd love to try this democracy thing that we that we claim uh, w w you know would would be the the way the West would like to export it. But we don't. We actually export the bullets instead of democracy. And um, it comes back to the cliche that." Uh, life is actually cheap. Death is expensive because you know you can you can buy you can buy bullets and the, you can actually in in somewhere like Syria you can actually say well the price per uh, arms deal works out at maybe eleven grand per per person shot. You know, and it's really that. I, I know I know I'm terrible for my always going into the financials of things, Mark. Oh, but you're right, Jam. <coughs> it can explain quite a lot. The, one of the, the, I would say about my experience making that documentary that, you know, the punk rock song, No More Heroes Anymore, yeah. Yeah. that is now my anthem. Even people like Chomsky, I've lost an awful lot of respect for because he actually defended Russia's intervention in Syria in spite of the fact the Russians are committing war crimes on an industrial scale, slaughtering civilians on the basis of the fact that the Russians were invited into Syria by the Assad regime. And one of the people in the documentary asked Chomsky the question, what is the basis for sovereignty? Are we in the time of the divine right of kings? Mm. You know, in the sense that it doesn't matter that the person wasn't elected by the people. It doesn't matter if he's a terrible dictator. But if he's opposed to the United States, this is the implication of mm. he could slaughter his own people and people on the left outside Syria are supports and support him simply uh, because he's allegedly opposed even, to the United States. But even if they're not supporting, there is a there is an element of tacit approval where you look the other way. It's geopolitics as well at play where you hear this week where Israel um who are, who are let's face it, masters of the propaganda uh routine they got out ahead of things and said hey, yeah we're after carrying out all these bombings inside syria don't worry about that one of our planes was shot <laughs> they shot back and you're going 
Well, well, hang on. What was the first sentence there you said? We carried out bombing in Syria, but don't worry about that. It was... Uh, can I, can yeah. I ask, before, before the Arab Revolution, back in 2000, before 2011, what, what way was Syria in, in world politics at that stage? Were, were, were Russia always an ally, or was did they have different allies? Have they made new allies because of what's gone on? Was Syria a place that you could survive in before the war, or was it somewhere you just didn't want to live before the war? Um, basically, Assad's father, essentially, the current president's father, established, if you like, the family business, if you like, dictatorship in Syria. He became master of the Ba'athist party, which had, if you like, a sort of a socialist orientation. Uh, and there's, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, he welded the country together. Now, it was quite a brutal dictatorship, you know, because uh, Yassin al Haj Saleh, who's produced a magnificent book called Impossible Revolution, and in fact, we got the title for the documentary from him. He made a very good point about the dictatorship of Assad's father. He said, if you were a communist, if you were an Islamist, if you were a Christian, if you were anything in Syria, as long as you were obedient, you could get away with anything. But if you were a communist, if you were an Islamist and you were disobedient, you would be tortured, you would be imprisoned. And if you were big enough and annoying enough, you probably would be killed as well. <laughs> so that was the nature of the kind of social contract, if you like. But I suppose what happened was, under Assad, uh, he adopted a very neoliberal model. He got gentrified. He got kind of, it's a very good, I didn't think of it like that, but it's an interesting analysis. All right. It's very, I think there's a lot in what, what you put it. Yeah, they began to identify marriage as a business elite. Mm. They adopted neoliberal policies. Many of the subsidies they used to give to the working class, to farmers and all that, were stripped away. And a lot of disaffection developed. So this helped to fuel the mm. potential for a revolution in Syria. And of course, years and years of humiliation and dictatorship and all exploded in 2011. And that did surprise a lot of people, though, for the reasons I've mentioned earlier. You know, the fact that it was such a, a brutal dictatorship. Well what, well, what happened was kids went out, sprayed on walls, got in trouble for spraying on walls and got beaten. And like to the, to the point where the army actually overstepped, like the army... For for want of a better term, there was always a bit of that kind of. There was also that that mindset in in Egypt a little bit that well, the army are kind of some are of us as well, and when the army went so far as to beat uh, children for um, spray painting anti regime uh, propaganda, that, as they as they put it, people actually got out in the streets and saw saw well, look, it's going on in Tunisia, it's going on in Libya, it's going on in Egypt. We can we can we can have a popular uprising. And, you know, Assad is gentrified. He's mm. not going to be as brutal as daddy was, only he was. And then Obama came out and said, I have a red line issue when it comes to chemical weapons because he didn't want to go into another uh, Middle Eastern war. He thought, we'll, we'll stay out of this and we'll make it, we'll say he won't go as far as chemical weapons. That, that red line was just a, a fraud because he, he went over it. Yeah, but you and make, back. they're good points you make, though, no question about it, you know. It, that really summarized the humiliation of these Syrian people. Those children who spray painted on the wall were given back to their parents in a horrific condition. They were dead. Mm. They had clearly been brutally tortured. And when their parents, when they went to protest to the military uh, governor, the people were insulted, with, uh, I, 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 as I recall this now. Uh, they were told that they would, uh, you know, it was dis I won't even repeat it, but it was mm. disgusting. But the point is that... Um, uh, well, I, would, I would like to remember that very accurately, and I, I just don't want to do it otherwise, or even say it. But, um, uh, well, actually, I think I will say it, because, you know, this is the, the the sheer brutality of that military regime. You know, for example, they told them they could go back home and produce more children. And if they couldn't produce the children, they could send their wives into the soldiers and they'd help yes. them for the children. That's the kind of contempt so, the Assad really military so. have for the Syrian yeah. people. And... I don't get that reflected on social media when I see these apologists for the Assad regime and for Putin and the way the Russians manage that propaganda is nightmarish. Uh, and unfortunately, it has taken in a lot of well-meaning people. Uh, hopefully, our documentary might make a tiny contribution in, in, in at least 
opening up the debate, giving them a better context in which to make their minds up on the whole subject. But the facts remain. If we care about other people, if we care about human rights, we have to look at who is actually committing the major human rights violations and address them and, and confront that reality. Because one of the points you make about Obama, Obama's role in Syria was criminal from start to finish. From the very beginning, Obama began calling for Assad to go. To go, yes. yes. But he never had any intention of doing that. So he led the opposition up the garden it's, path. It's the, it's, was, it goes back to the Iraq, the Iraqi war, the first Gulf War, when they dropped the, the leaflet saying, rise up against Saddam and America will support is, you. It, you're, you're one of the few people, I haven't really made that comparison, but it's very valid. And I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but it's so true because there was an element of that. Yeah. But there was always that uncertainty that he might do it. You know, mm. when he drew, drew the red line, mm. it actually did protect people in the sense that Assad knew if he crossed that red line, you know, if they really escalated the killing onto an industrial scale, there was some, some penalty to be paid. But the moment Obama failed to act on that, that gave Assad the green light. Mm. That greatly helped ISIS and some of the more militant jihadi groups, because obviously they got more supporters, because they then could say to the moderate opposition, the people who had taken up arms, who didn't want to take up arms, who never wanted to see the revolution militarized, uh, that look, the West are never going to help you. They betrayed you. You see, so do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. Like Derry if, you, if, if you're sitting Ireland, there, if you're after the Paris gun, the people down the street, and how easy the IRA had it hmm. recruiting people, you know, that's the mentality we were dealing with at that stage. Assad then really had the upper hand, and more importantly, Putin knew then. Yeah. That the Americans, like Russia, is a small economy. It's smaller than the state of New York. Putin can't afford to be the great imperial power. I mean, it's laughable the way he prances across the stage, you know, in that sense. So, um, but nonetheless, I don't want to appear to be anti-Russian here uh, because I, 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 I have great respect for the Russian people. But unfortunately, they've allowed themselves... Uh, the luxury, if you like, of um, of of uh, seeing Putin in Syria, they've blind, they've become blind to the fact that he's slaughtering civilians to make them feel good, you know, to make up for the shortcomings yeah, in the world economy. To be big on the big on the world stage. When when the exactly to be big on the world stage, yeah. When, when the the Arab Spring started, as you said. Obama promised, or, or or at least gave a green a green light to people to say, yeah, it's okay, we got your back. And then he let everybody else down. Of course, that created a vacuum. And was it into this vacuum then we got the extremists came into this vacuum? I'm glad you asked that question, though, really, because this is really important. When the peaceful uprising started in 2011, millions of people, we have a, you get all the footage is there, you know, and it's in our document. You can see these mass demonstrations. You can see the regime gunning people down the street. Immediately, the Assad sought to militarize the, the situation. He shot peaceful demonstrators. But at the same time, he released hardened jihadis, 1,500 hardened jihadis from his prisons because he wanted to try to poison the revolution. He wanted to create a kind of, in inverted commas, terrorist opposition. He could say to the West, I'm fighting the war on terror. For Which you. he does a lot. Yeah, but if you look at the record, he, the opposition, which never wanted to become militarized, and you know why they didn't want to take up arms? Because they knew they'd all be slaughtered. Mm. Because Assad had the upper hand. The military had the guns, they yeah. had the weapons. That's why it was a peaceful uprising. Because people knew they'd be killed. But in the end, some of them, obviously, uh, when they were being shot at, they were afraid to be arrested, obviously, because if you were arrested, your chance of being tortured to death is very high. I think it's really important that people understand, though, that um, put that in context the same way you said it, that if, if you, they, we use the word the war on terrors, it just became this blanket thing to throw on people mm. um, very much to the case where, as you said, into Martin, as you said, into the vacuum sweeps. ISIS and he said there was all these there was Al Qaeda in the Levant there was you know all these disparate groups that uh just the the, the only cohesion they found ultimately was so con a flag of convenience was the black flag sadly and uh you know we in the West w can say that 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 was uh that justifies some of the reaction of of oh well we can't be seen to fight on the side of the terrorists but at the same time you have to 
go almost take a helicopter view of that and realize, well, some of that was being funded by other players in the game. You had arms being provided to Al Qaeda and ISIS, which, you know, came from Saudi Arabia and they were ultimately American arms, actually, because who, where did they buy their weapons from? Just to, just to clarify the situation, though, in, in terms of the way the, uh, things became very militarized. From the start, the stats started killing peaceful demonstrators. That's a fact. Mm. The, he never intended to negotiate. It's not like even the, the regime in Egypt, you know, which was kind of a, a system, if you like. But in the dictatorship in Syria is a family business. Mm. So if a sad goes, the whole thing goes. So you promised an election of of a of on on a of a piecemeal of a, of almost a a little bit of a, a more a little bit more local governance for yourself, but still you all report to the dawn. Oh yeah, basically yeah. But I mean, nobody would be taken in by that really because it fundamentally is a totalitarian totalitarian style dictatorship. Now, one of the problems from the very beginning, as I said, for the opposition, they didn't want it militarized or didn't want to resort to violence because they knew they'd all be killed. And they knew the form of the regime because when the Muslim Brotherhood uh, rebelled in the 1980s, Robert Fisk, in fairness, uh, made the point that maybe 20 to 40,000 were killed by Assad and Hamel, for example. So that's the nature of the regime. They slaughter the Hamel was a, yeah. and they kill everybody. And everybody knows that's the way they're treated. So clearly people didn't want to. Uh, uh, but this is the point, I think. It's so depressing, in fact, where people have missed this point, really, in the sense that that's from the beginning, Assad, as I say, began shooting peaceful demonstrators. But more importantly, and this really needs to be understood as well, and I, I myself found this hard to comprehend, but we interviewed Ken Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch, and he was the one who actually used this phrase, which I had come to the same conclusion from all the research we've done, all the people we met, and all the Syrians and so forth, that it fundamentally is a war against civilians, a war against civilians. And that sounds like a very, you know, hyperbolic phrase, but the reason it's a war against civilians is because Assad wanted to liquidate all opposition. So if there's an opposition area, they did not want that democratic revolution to take hold because they saw the people electing local councils. They saw a genuine civil society developing. That never happened before. Free newspapers, free radio stations, all this kind of cultural democratic infrastructure being yeah. created, taking hold. So if you want to maintain a totalitarian dictatorship, you will raise it. And this is how much gave the jihadis a chance to get in. So Assad adopts a scorched earth policy hmm. using barrel bombs and bombing areas indiscriminately. And that, of course, chokes up massive death toll and spawns, spawns a refugee crisis, which really escalated after Obama failed to act on the red line. And this was the thrust of their strategy to move people on. And, you know, obviously, when the areas are destroyed like that, it gave the jihadis a chance to come in. Because when they came in first, they didn't say to people, we're here to set up a caliphate and chop mm. people's heads off. <laughs> they say, we're just here to help you. Yeah. You've been slaughtered by these people. Let us help you, blah, blah. And then, of course, they began killing the opposition. And this point, I find infuriating when I see the pro-Russian and pro-Assad trolls talking about Russia and Assad fighting ISIS. They ignored ISIS because ISIS was killing these people who risked their lives for democracy. That, for example, Jane's Defence Weekly said in 2014, 2014, only 4% of Assad's military attacks were directed at ISIS. Who was fighting ISIS? The opposition were fighting ISIS. Because ISIS, as we all know, yeah. have no time for democracy. But again, Assad's narrative, Assad's propaganda was so effective. But it was effective because Russia has a capacity for doing that. And again, many on the left buy this thing that if you're opposed to the Americans, and I'm as much opposed to American imperialism as the next, but if the Americans commit war crimes, I'll be the first person to say it. If Israel is committing war crimes against the Palestinians, as you will know from social media in particular, I'll be the first person to say it. But I will not discriminate. I will condemn all forces in the Middle East so this that commit is, this atrocities. Is, this is sort of, the left has to a greater extent adopted enemy or my enemy is my friend type of, of view of what's going on in Syria. I, I would say it's, it's even worse than that because they know, you know, I cannot understand 
how somebody like Jeremy Corbyn, for example, he must know what's going on. And I cannot understand how these old relationships are allowed to obscure their you, You've been talking about the old relationships, we'll say with Russia, that's, that's exactly. that old relationship. Exactly, or that traditional thing in the in the Middle East, if, if you're opposed to the Americans, you must be good. You know what I mean? It's obvious. You know, America America as the great Satan is, is a very easy... America's uh, the great Satan, yeah. But, uh, but I'm uh, quite happy to condemn the Americans over the Iraq war. I marched against the Iraq war as well, like everybody else. Uh, but don't ask me to remain silent when I see things happening in Syria. But I, at the same time, though, I don't want to get involved in the politics of Syria, ironically. I want to report... I want to film, I want to expose these shocking massacres of innocent civilians. And civilians who committed only one crime, they actually were prepared, risked their lives to peacefully protest for democracy. And I think that's a disgrace that they've been ignored, they've been called terrorists when, by Assad, when all they did was dare to protest against his horrifically brutal dictatorship. We we were. Um, I'm glad you went back to Hama because it's important that that like we always have we have re, re, uh, recency bias and things. We always think you know this is the thing that happened, and you got to remember Hama was left as a black spot where they they literally wiped out an entire t- an entire town for want of a better, and it was a real marker was laid down that that's what dissent gets you. So it's very much you know if you want to talk dystopian. That's where that that was a really uh, 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 that was that echoed for decades, and when when they needed to do it again, you know, Assad went well. Maybe they think I'm not my dad. I'll show them. Well, there, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of of difference there between what Assad did and what happened in Iraq with the Kurds, where they were all uh, all killed and gassed. It's the same psyche behind both. Yeah, it's a very interesting comparison, but as you say, it's the very same psychology all over again, you know, and it's depressing. And uh, you, you can see the problem. People, it's only confusing because people are imposing their own, uh, you know, prejudices, political prejudices on the Middle East and making it fit a reality that does not exist. You know, they don't see millions of Syrians bravely, courageously, you know, people who are suffering economically, workers, farmers, etc., in a neoliberal environment. And on the other hand, they're being humiliated by a very brutal dictatorship and they decide to rise up peacefully and protest and they're gunned down. Like they're the kind of people anybody on the left, you'd imagine, will be proud to stand by. But who do they stand by? They stood by the brutal dictator Assad. And then they called the innocent civilians terrorists because he was calling them terrorists for daring to protest against his regime. I mean, it just, as Yassin al Hajj said, it's an upside down world. And, and the, the refugees that have, and, and we know that there are, it's the largest refugee problem on the, the planet is exactly. Syrian refugees. They would generally be the people that Assad wants out of. Country. Exactly. And again, uh, the German, uh, we have this in the documentary as well, research has been done among the refugees. Why did you flee Syria? Uh, more than 70% said they fled because of SAD. Many of them cited the barrel bombs. A much smaller number cited ISIS. So the fundamental problem is SAD. The refugee crisis really took off after Obama failed to act on the red line uh, because then Assad really went wild if you like and of course he had the support from Russia but there's a, the missing ingredient which I find almost laughable when I hear people talking about the Assad regime as a secular regime yeah now let's analyze Assad's military forces Iran with Hezbollah and all the quite brutal Shia militia they brought in from Afghanistan from Pakistan from Iraq and from Iran there's quite a large number of them they would probably represent more than 80% of Assad's fighting forces. In the battle for Aleppo, Iran on the ground, was Russia bombing Aleppo from the air, Iran with its myriad militia, including Hezbollah, the on the ground. Guard. And this is suppo- exactly revolutionary guard. And this is supposed to be Assad, and we're told it's a secular regime. And why is Assad's forces, why is his forces so weak? Because so many soldiers defected from Assad's army early on because they refused to slaughter fellow Syrians and we're asked to believe by many people shamefully in my view on the left <laughs> that we should be supporting Assad I mean it's it would be laughable well, or well, not so was, tragic straight comes to my mind is you're looking at a situation where the, the Irish popular 
population is supporting the black and trans. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, I mean, it just, it beggars belief. Like, in other words, in the black and tan, it's like saying we should be supporting the Brits, arming the black and tans, killing people. And uh, Sad as well had his own has his own Shabia, yeah. which are exactly like the Black and Tans. Worse. Rape, murder, brutal beyond description. And we have people in the documentary who talk about that as well. So in that sense, you know, I mean, it gives you a rounded picture that it's like some, it's the triumph, if you like, for a propaganda mm. campaign. In a sense that a lot of people who would be natural allies, you would imagine, of them have been deluded by a pretty vile propaganda campaign, in my view. Well, in the, in the, in the, Broader sense, though, um, just to get it, like, think about his, uh, for example, the last town in the world where Aramaic was spoken was in Syria. So the, the language of Christ himself, there was the village and they rolled in and they destroyed it. It's, it's, you know, these things are no more. Some of the, and we, you know, we talk about, so I know the human cost is huge as well. Clearly it's, it's more important than anything else. But what has, what has happened is also a stripping of culture, a stripping of history, a stripping of civil society and all of those things have been, and, and that is one of the oldest civilizations on the face of the planet. It's not, you're not talking about, uh, you know, um, Imperial America and Great Britain. It long predates all of that. You know, there were, there were, these were the, these were the cradles of civilization where, 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 where Iraq and Syria's borders meets. They reckon that the original Garden of Eden, uh, legend comes from, you know, these are the, the places we're talking about here. Mm. And how, how do we go from, from that to chemical weaponry being used? And, and why has the, the, the use of chemical weapons become the focus of Who's right and who's wrong in Syria? But again, this gets back to the propaganda war. But there was a very good military rationale for Assad using chemical weapons. Because again, the whole strategy was to terrorize civilians and opposition areas to flee. They want to get rid of them. They want them to leave. And obviously, you put in chemical weapons. They don't kill a lot of people necessarily. Although the one in Ghouta killed up to 1,500 people. That was a terrible attack by Assad. And if you look at all the hard research on that, you look at the credible reports, look at the Cannes Shakun report, the recent sarin gas attack in Syria, the independent UN investigation blamed Assad for that unequivocally. And still you have the pro-Russian propaganda operation that backs Assad still pumping out the propaganda and the, making the most bizarre, um, uh, developing the most bizarre scenarios to imply the opposition. I mean, when you look at it on the ground, I mean, from the very beginning of the Khan Shakun uh, sarin gas attack, I was amazed. The first journalist into Khan Shakun was uh, Karim Shaheen from The Guardian. Mm. And he's a credible independent journalist. And long before all the research, and they alleged that uh, they had bombed, uh, I think it was uh, some chemical warehouse. warehouse. That's right. And he said, I went, I looked, at, there was no warehouse would look because he went around the area that yeah. was at the very beginning and nothing that ever tra- i mean that was a joint investigation the un organized with the organization for the prevention prevention or prohibition of chemical weapons and they did a thorough research and catch and they said no assad is guilty end of story and we're quite and it was a fairly unequivocal uh unequivocal outcome the russians of course regretted they allowed that investigation to go through obviously because mm. they never imagined they were going to be they would be so undiplomatic as to actually nail Assad, yeah. but they did, uh, which was unusual and very refreshing, you know. Can I ask though, and here's the thing that, that, that I don't see a finish line. I know that sounds really bad in terms of my, my, my language is probably clumsy, but there's no end to this. There's no, um, it's a fair, it's a fair, it's a tragically fair comment for this reason. Um, the far, there are a lot of, Proxy wars being fought over That's Syria. Exactly now. it. It's and this is one of the big problems that the people who are not being listened to in Syria are civilians on the ground. The millions who peacefully went out onto the street, many of them are still living in Syria. Admittedly, a lot of them have fled the country. And you must remember that the Assad regime is quite a brutal dictatorship. So people in Syria, when they ask them, what do you think of Assad? They're not going to say, oh, yes, well, we actually would prefer an election, you know, for having well, a free kind of the North Korea flag waving. There's a touch of that yeah. about it. So, I mean, so therefore, when people say, oh, I visited Syria and it looked very like we have it here in the West, blah, blah. Yeah, well, you must remember it is a dictatorship. You can't take your kind of tourist visit for 12 days or one day or whatever it is. And you then say, well, I can draw a conclusion when half the population, like 14 million, have been forced to flee their homes. Yeah. 
Many of them are internally displaced, over 5 million refugees outside the country. So against that background, uh, we need a political settlement. The Syrians are entitled to it. But the only way they're going to get it, to get back to your point, is if the foreign powers get around the table and agree to allow the Syrians to do it, to decide their own destiny. Of course Assad can't be part of the future because he's killed so hundreds of thousands uh, and maimed millions. He obviously is in a strong position militarily at the moment. But at the same time, he's only that way because he's propped up by Russia, number one, over 80% of his fighting force are made up of Iran, Hezbollah, various quite brutal Shia militias. He's got these kind of mafia type forces as well, because his own forces are quite fractured as well. So on the one hand, you might see on the opposition side, a myriad of opposition groups, military type groups as well, as well as the more hardened jihadis like Al-Qaeda and so forth, uh, or their uh, representatives. But it's very important to remember the Syrian people don't support, the Syrians are moderates really. They want a democracy. If they're given a chance, they will obviously surprise the world. And I would have to say just on the on on that, I, the outlook for that is very bleak, um, because obviously uh, Assad knows the only way he leave power is is more or less dead. Let's let's call the truth. He, he's looking at it. He, he wins or he dies, and um, he, his Alawite. Uh, regime that's that's there supported that way and we have ox- proxy war sunni shia war going on we have disparate groups we have jihadist groups and we have geopolitics of iran saudi arabia and we have geopolitics of russia and america so you've got a toxic yeah one of the big one of the things to keep an eye on i think in syria too is the obviously the competition between iran and saudi arabia is crucial mm. like both of them have, have, have um, backed uh, opposite sides in syria now, Iran appears to have won because obviously Assad is in the ascent again. And Assad, Russia actually, ironically, despite all the publicity Russia gets, and that's obviously good for the folks back home, mm. uh, Iran doesn't strive to take the credit for allowing Assad to survive. But of course, Iran is responsible for Assad surviving because the 80% of his force on the ground are made up or controlled directly and indirectly by them. So in a sense, they really are. But obviously, that has aggravated the Saudis. So this Sunni-Shia civil war in the Middle East, which because of what's happened in Syria has been fueled enormously. And obviously Israel is playing in that mix as well. You know what rumors and all sorts of scenarios being painted about the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel even. It's a sign of growing instability. And Israel's recent intervention in Syria bombing, uh, yes. which has really hit yes. Iran very hard. So clearly the mix could not be more incendiary, but it obviously goes back to the same Point, that if the Syrian people, and of course the Israelis are afraid of this, the Saudis are afraid of this, the Iranians are afraid of all of these regimes are afraid of the Syrian people being given a democratic vote to decide their own future. Because they're not going to toe the line from Saudi Arabia. They're not going to toe the line from Iran. And they're certainly not going to toe the line for, for Israel because all sides in Syria have great empathy with the Palestinians. Many people in the uh, Syrian revolution obviously were very upset that they didn't get immediate support from the Palestinians who they thought might have been their natural allies. But in fairness, many Palestinians recently have come to see the brutalization and the terrible cruelty inflicted on the Syrian people who bravely rose up against it. And you look at the Syrians in Yarmouk, or the Palestinians in Yarmouk, who were brutally attacked as well. Like they can give you plenty of evidence of how brutal the Assad regime uh, was to the Palestinians. Do the Syrians have the capacity or the, or the resources to rebuild their country if they had the chance of democracy? Can they do it? No, uh, the Syrian people are, uh, in my view, amazing. I mean, what they've suffered and the way they still survive under brutal fire, bombing and so forth. They're very resilient people, I have no doubt. They will emerge ultimately. They will find. They will ultimately emerge with a democracy. Uh, it's not over by a long shot in the sense that people who... who who bravely, who went out in the street peacefully protesting for democracy, they're still there, they still want that. Obviously, they're very depressed, uh, they're very upset. They were let down by us because they assumed if we shared the same values and they went out in the street peacefully, they thought we would come to their assistance and not allow that to happen. Um, In terms of resources, of course the West should not help Assad to rebuild Syria. Assad should have no part in the future of Syria. But only Syrians should decide that. That's why you need a political settlement. And then, obviously, when there is a political settlement, 
resources should be provided to Syria to rebuild the country. It obviously can't do it on its own. Now, the Assad regime, obviously, being a kleptocratic, corrupt, extremely corrupt regime, they are obviously trying to get resources from China, from Russia. But as I explained, the Russian economy is in dire straits and they're in no position to do it because they are owed a lot of money by Assad. The Iranians are owed billions by Assad. <laughs> was, uh, so they was... want the Chinese perhaps to provide the money and they want the money back as well and also to share the spoils of rebuilding and so forth. There was, there was an interesting point when you made earlier about um, people defected early on and things. And many did, many who refused to turn their guns on their on oh, their yeah, brother, on their, on their neighbors and brothers mm. and sisters but also a lot of senior guys who happen to have homes in london um mm. they all defected but the reason they defected is because they already knew that they had maybe three or four million in the bank somewhere that they could you know mm. they had parachutes and they were out and uh, that's when it became obvious when was it sergey lobov is that the the, the russian farmer yeah. all of a sudden he starts appearing all over aleppo and things like that as opposed to actually assad's general started to, to thin out but the russian uh, foreign minister who who was basically putin's voice uh, arrives on the scene so yeah so i sound so I, i'm very I sound very pessimistic about it, but I'd like to think that there is a political settlement once people could get over the peacocking and the. Uh... Yeah, I I think you you've a, there's a lot in what you say, but really the hope for Syria only exists if we rediscover our humanity and demand that the massacre and the murder and the mass murder of civilians by Assad and Putin on a daily basis at the moment in Italy, the Eastern Country, where they're bombing civilians in the tradition which they've adopted since uh, Assad has adopted since 2011 and the Iranians with their with Hezbollah and all these myriad militias on an industrial scale are engaging in numerous war crimes and that's not to say that some of the opposition groups are not ha having the case to answer of course they have a case Absolutely. to answer but in terms of when you look at the overall picture like who is killing the most civilians? Who's responsible for most of it? When Assad is responsible for 90% of civilian casualties, and he's the president of the country, he has a legal responsibility to respect and protect his own people, apart from the moral and ethical one. And we have an even bigger responsibility to protect our fellow uh, human beings, and we're not doing it. We want a peaceful settlement in Syria. Then we should be defending these people's human rights. Then there is hope for Syria. Because then the military solution is not possible if we demand respect for human rights, if we demand that people have committed war crimes or prosecuted. And if that sounds idealistic, I'm sorry, but that's the only hope for the future. Ronan, will you remind us where it's on again and where people can go and see this? Because this, people need to see this. We, we can talk about it here for 40 minutes, but, but you know, a documentary of it visually taken apart from start to finish, that's what people need to see to get the... The mindset changed. So remind us, it's in... Yeah, well, it's actually very easy to see it, really. If you just go on Eventbrite, you'll find DCU, uh, the event I just... Eventbrite.ie, on, on, yeah. Yeah, on the, on the 15th of... Uh, that's just... Uh, um, that's this week, isn't it? Yeah, it's yes. two days' time. Yeah, it's two days' time. Yeah, see. <laughs> you better, better hurry and get this out. You better hurry. Uh, yeah, exactly. But then it's in Trinity in the Edmund Burke Theatre on the 22nd at 6.30, so we say 6.15 for, and it's on a first come, first serve base in Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, no it's excuse. so much space know, there. But plenty of space there, Lovely. actually, you know. Lovely. But as I say, it's first come, first serve. Everywhere we've had it's been packed out, so I mean, that says something, I suppose. I mean, I think it shows a hunger for knowledge about Syria. Yes. And people seem to find this documentary a very useful primer, because I don't want to give people the impression that I've made up my mind about Syria. This documentary was very much a discovery mission by ourselves about the reality. So we show all sides, but we don't shy away from presenting uh, the reality of who is committing the majority of the war crimes. You know, I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're neutral, but, but you know, I mean, in a sense, we're... Uh, we're you know, we, 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 you know, we, we're human beings. We for have the, to stand up, for the we have to stand against war crimes. I put it like for that. the third time, uh, we're going to mention Robert Fisk on this, and he always said you have to stand on the side of the people who are who are who are dying. <laughs> you well, know? I, I think that actually, you know, uh, I would like Robert to have done a bit more of that in recent years in Syria, mind you. But are we the look? 
But the point is that it would it would certainly be our philosophy. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to show, to put the whole thing in a, in a fair context to allow people to make up their own minds. And so far, the reaction we've got is people seem to think we've done that, which is obviously great. We, we're happy with that, you know. Well, I'll certainly be going along to Trinity. I want to, to get this straight in my head and, and know what's going on. I'm fed up relying on different people's reports from social media I want something that's a bit clearer that I can read into myself so I'll definitely be going I find that interesting that you think you're going to be allowed into Trinity (laughs) (laughs) I really find that staggering no listen thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about it as well it was very enjoyable as well and I appreciate the opportunity as well it's great Ronan listen you've done great work um, and we're, we're actually really thrilled that you came over it's great to have it's great to have a chat about it it's I hope listeners appreciate it that that it's 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 a it is a complex situation. There are things there, but but you have to when you boil it right down, you you summed it up. Civilians are dying. It's not. Let's forget about uh, the flags. Let's forget about the the badges of convenience on and the the creeds or whatever it is. Civilians are dying, folks. And if we don't actually understand that and we don't stand against the people who are actually dying. You know, what sort of humanity have we? Well, we have to remember well said, that yeah, 90% well of them are dying from under assets and that's it. Full stop. Well, look, guys, I want to thank you all again for listening. Um, we're, we're, we're really thrilled how things are going, but I leave, ask, make sure you tell your friends, tell whoever's, whoever, whoever you get into there, get, get us on. Yeah. Look, Tony has put, and, and Tony and I have put up this thing. We're trying to get a new mic, get a bit of new software. So you'll see it on our website and it's up on our at Echo Chambers pod on Twitter. Look, go in there, buy us a coffee. We buy a decent mic. We do be able to do better interviews, maybe do group interviews. That's kind of where we're angling towards. So if you can, buy us a coffee. It's $3. You know, we're not making any money out of it. Thank you. Thanks, folks.